Um, my name is Lauren. I am a humane educator in our community engagement department. So I basically go out and educate the public on animal welfare. And today we're going to be talking with some members of our humane law enforcement department all about animal hoarding. So I'm going to just start off by going over some kind of housekeeping things. You can keep your screen or your camera rather on or off, whatever you prefer. Um, we do ask that you stay muted just so there's not any like weird feedback going on while our presenters are speaking. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to please just type those in the chat. If it's anything that I can field, I'm happy to just type a response to you um, directly in the chat. And if it's something that we need one of um, our experts to answer, we'll save those to the end and I'll kind of compile a little list um, where they can watch or read those and answer them for you. So I think that is about all as far as housekeeping goes. And before we get started, I just wanted to show off a couple of our animals. So I'm gonna screen share with you really quickly. We have a program at San Diego Humane Society called Rad Animals or Ready and Deserving Animals. So these are pets that have been with us for a long period of time that we like to spotlight on our website. So I'm gonna just show you a couple of these cute faces and then I'll pass it over to our guest speakers. So if you log on to our website, these guys are all going to be under featured animals. And they're all animals, like I said, that have been here for a long amount of time. And I picked two to show off to you all today. The first is Kitty. Kitty was actually featured on our Humane at Home Facebook series a couple weeks ago. Um, our resident artist, Lovejoy, actually made a painting of her. So if you adopt Kitty or if anyone adopts Kitty, they will actually go home with a really beautiful pop art painting of her. So I'll just kind of scroll through. She's a She's a large lady, but she she's really cute and definitely deserves a nice home. And if you are looking for kind of more of an unconventional pet, perhaps you might want to take a look at a pig. For those of you who maybe have not been up to our Escondido campus before, we do have farm animals up there. So chickens, roosters, pigs, all kinds of fun stuff. And Babe has been with us for quite some time as well. Babe, just like Kitty, also comes with a painting. So it's a, it's a really great little, little package deal. You get a cute pig and a sweet painting. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and I'm going to pass it over to our two guest speakers today. We have Corporal Romero and then Officer Barrara and they're going to be taken over from here. So I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight them and they'll get started. Let me just go ahead and do that. All right, Corporal Romero, whenever you are ready, we are good to go. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen one second. Hi everyone, how are y'all doing? Good morning. Having a good morning. 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 So we're gonna be talking about animal hoarding, a look inside animal hoarding with humane law enforcement. And I don't think I'm sharing my screen yet, am I? Or am I? You are sharing. Um, okay. If you want to go to the, the icon at the bottom to make it large I'm screen. I'm clicking on it, and for some reason, it's not working. So let me try this again. Sorry, technical difficulties. So while um, Corporal Ramirez is uh, Romero is uh, loading that up, um, so we're going to be talking about animal hoarding, um, kind of getting giving you a behind the scenes look at everything. Um, Corporal uh, Romero has been here for several years, I think since 2016 or so. She's been uh, a wonderful officer. I've learned a lot from her myself, and I've been here for almost three years now. Um, we've she's done a lot of crazy hoarding cases, and I've done a good amount of myself, but. Um, we're excited to talk to you guys about all that today and what we've learned over the years. And it's still loading. Can you see it? I have it up now. It's not showing the presentation. It's just stuck on the um, folder. Hmm. There, there it is. 
Okay, yay. Thank you, Officer Barrera, for that introduction. I'll let you start. So we're starting off this um, presentation kind of with a bang. We're gonna do a video uh, with one of our ride-along series that was made. This is a case that I worked on um, a few years ago. Uh, this was a hoarding case that lasted um, probably eight to nine months or so, bringing in cats over a lot of time. Um, and I had taken over this case for another officer. Um, so we, over a couple of months, had picked up approximately 50 cats or so. Um, and this lady, you know, just took in a bunch of cats. She would find them on the street, whichever she loved cats. So they were a lot in her house. She wasn't necessarily hoarding a lot of stuff, but she had a lot of cats. Um, during this trip, we picked up approximately 25 cats and we had to leave traps um, so we could check them at a later point because we were unable to pick up all of them during one uh, visit. The owner was evicted and then the cats needed to be picked up. Um, and then a lot of the cats in this video you'll see um, overall were okay, but because they lived in such a congested environment, many of the cats were FIV positive. Uh, so we'll show um, what happened during this video in a cool video that one of our um, uh, media people made. much we're here to uh, pick up a bunch of cats that somebody has left behind uh, that person was evicted from their home and we're gonna pick up and take in about 30 plus or minus five cats to the shelter for emergency boarding this would be a hoarding case but it's not hoarding stuff it's hoarding cats and now there's three there too a black one a tabby and the red <laughs> See the eyes? Yeah. yeah, most of them are like that. They're all like that. They're pretty much all FIV positive. And there's another one right here too. Oh geez. Oh man. Oh. You want a box? Something. <laughs> that was quick. Hi. Hi, Mimos. Even the itty bitty ones got you eyes. We can just bring it inside because it's warm, it's cooler. Mm. Oh, it's hot. Yeah. We're gonna need nets for those guys. The cats are not very well socialized. Some of them might be. Um, I was able to handle the younger ones, which are probably about three to four months old. Um, the older ones are not very socialized. They have some upper respiratory infection and other physical symptoms that you could see. Yeah, we call them popcorn cats. They're bouncing all over the ceilings. So that's gonna be a little bit fun catching them, but we'll probably have to use nets for this. Yep. Here, come on in. Uh, of course, when the kitties get a little bit more scared and stressed out, they start running around places. We had a bunch sitting on top of the cupboards in the kitchen. We had some under the couches, in the piano, things like that. And then, you know, you just have to work together to push them into a corner to be able to catch them. Emergency boarding, because we're not able to get in touch with the owner. Um, she was evicted from the property. And if we can't get in touch with them, we don't have their permission to take the animals as our property. So we'll hold them for two weeks until an owner, if, if she comes by. Um, that one could go in with the other black kitty, okay. wherever that is. We're running out of room. Oh, there's two more cats in here. But sometimes they do calm down and we're able to handle them later. There's eight in there. Chill, chill. Three, it's okay, it's okay. Hey, let go. really chunky. I think it might be pregnant. I'm trying to get all the ones without a net because there's not a lot of room in here. There's one behind you guys. And there's a black one right behind you. Just be careful. Okay. Ready? Go ahead. You can let go. I know. Oh, hold on. Hold on. 
Yeah, that one's the messed up one. Careful with this one. Let me get that out of the way. Hi. Okay. I don't want you to bite me. That was a little fun. Yeah, it's always fun catching a bunch of cats, but we caught the younger ones pretty easily. Honestly, it's just what I can do to help because this kind of thing is, uh, you know, it is an illness. It's a mental illness that somebody wants to take on so many animals. All I want to do is be able to help them so they can, we can alleviate some of that stress, but also be able to help what they're going through in their own life. Now we're good. That was in the middle of summer. We were all dripping sweat. Um, if you want to pause the video again. Okay. Um, so that was a lot of fun, obviously, because we like to catch cats like that. We don't get to do that very often. Um, but, you know, we wanted to bring them in. And then the next slide will show um, the definition of animal hoarding, which is... Um, So this is uh, one of the best um, uh, definitions that I could find by Dr. Gary Patronick. Um, someone who accumulates a large number of animals fails to provide minimal standards of nutrition, sanitation, and veterinary care, and fails to act on the deteriorating con condition of the animals, including disease, starvation, and even death. For the environment, severe over overcrowding, extremely unsanitary conditions, or the negative effect of the collection on their own health and well-being and on that of other household members. That's very all-encompassing of everything that we're dealing with when we go into a hoarding case. Uh, so the definition of animal hoarding, if we break it down even more, is the failure to provide minimal standards of sanitation, space, nutrition, and veterinary care for the animals. Uh, it's the inability to recognize what's actually going on. Um, you can't necessarily see what's in front of you, though. If there's filth, if there's a lot of stuff, there's an overcrowding of animals. Um, obsessive attempts to accumulate or maintain a collection of animals in the face of progressively deteriorate, deteriorating conditions. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, everything in the home, but there would be also um, plumbing might not be working, electricity might be out, there might be a lot of other things that come with um, this obsessiveness. Denial, denial or minimization of problems and living conditions for people and animals. Demographics of animal hoarders. So most people think of animal hoarders as the crazy cat lady, but in reality, animal hoarders can be men, can be professionals, parents, they can appear completely normal to the outside world. Um, animal hoarding can begin as early as the age of 30, and um, a lot of them have caregiver backgrounds. They are generally well-educated. So the crazy cat lady is just a stereotype. <clears throat> household characteristics. So in many cases, you may find um, a lack of a working bathroom, a lack of functional facilities such as cooking facilities, a refrigerator that doesn't work, um, maybe no heat or electricity in the home. So those are things you can find um, typically in, in, in the homes of animal hoarders. Um, you may also find soaked beds and other furniture. Um, over 80% of animal hoarders also hoard inanimate objects, such as uh, newspapers, magazines, old mail, clothing, books. So there is no specific number of animals that need to be present to be considered a hoarding case. A person can own just six birds and still be classified as an animal hoarder because of the compulsive desire to accumulate more without providing proper care and sanitation and veterinary care. Uh, on the other hand, a person can own 12 cats and not be classified as an animal hoarder because they're actually controlling that number. They're providing the care and giving a healthy environment to those animals. Uh, sometimes those environments that you'll see here, they can be crowded, unsanitary, create a very stressful place for the animals. And because of the hoarding situation, diseases spread very quickly. Um, in those cases, many of those animals do not, many or even all of those animals do not receive the veterinary care that they would need. And this can also lead to starvation and ultimately sometimes death. 
Um, in these hoarding environments, um, there's very high levels of ammonia. This is very dangerous to our health, animals' health as well. Um, these elevated levels of ammonia are caused by urine, feces, and lack of sanitation. Um, these exposures, um, it's in the air. So the second we walk in, sometimes your eyes are watering, your nose is running. The second um, you're there, you can feel those physical symptoms. Um, Environmental Health Department can provide ammonia readings, and there's sometimes um, ammonia readers that you can buy yourself as well. Um, and like I said, you'll get the burning of the eyes, nose, throat, and your whole respiratory system will be hurting. Um, there's coughing, wheezing. Um, you'll, I get a migraine right away. Um, so those are that's something to be really careful of, um, and you want to have proper ventilation when you're entering these homes. The air in a hoarder's home can be so irritating to the respiratory tract that a person that's not acclimated to this kind of environment cannot normally enter without protective uh, without a uh, protective breathing apparatus. Uh, brief exposures, which is like less than five minutes or so, can cause a lot of irritation and nasal dryness in people. Children and elderly are much higher at risk for um, when exposed to ammonia, but that's not saying that um, not everyone is at risk. Literally everyone is, they're just more at high risk. A concern with acclimat acclimatization um, is it could decrease the ability to detect other dangerous gases or smoke, such as fire, uh, that could be um, concerns for fire. This is a huge safety risk because you can't smell anything else. Prolonged exposure to ammonia can increase um, the serum cortisol concentration, which is the stress hormone in animals, and that can actually be detected if we bring in um, animals, uh, which leads to the animals eating less. The irritation from the ammonia increases the chance of developing respiratory diseases and also the loss of lung function over time. Um, this is some of uh, examples of personal protective equipment that I'm some, a lot of people are um, more aware of all of these right now with the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we do use those when we go into a home. Um, right now we're wearing masks all the time, but we will need a stronger mask like an N95 mask. We wear gloves, we wear booties, we wear a full gown. And these are in extreme cases. Um, we want to be fully suited up, sometimes even a face mask, uh, a face shield, sorry. Um, so because the environment might be that hazardous. So animals hoarded. Uh, domestic species are usually the largest group of animals represented in animal hoarding cases, and that's most likely because of the availability of them and the relative ease of care with, that comes with them. Um, the, high frequency, the high frequency of uh, cats involved in animal hoarding cases could be explained by the fact that cats are just easier to conceal than dogs but it is not uncommon for animal hoarders to have multiple uh, different species, um, such as dogs and cats and, you know, in, in the same home. Um, although they do tend to stay with just one particular species um, and concentrate on that one uh, species of animal. So um, here we have, uh, you know, some of the more common ones that we see and it, yeah, 65% of the animals involved are usually cats. Um, so animal hoarders are not going to have healthy or socialized animals most of the time. Fortunately for us at San Diego Humane Society, we have an outstanding team of medical professionals and behavior professionals that dedicate their time to working with these animals. Um, so 80% of these animals are found in extremely poor conditions. Not all the time are they really poor, bleed, um, Ex, you know, exhibiting poorer symptoms, um, but 80% of the time we do bring them in and they have a lot of other things going on. Um, there's also a lot of um, psychological suffering, not just for the animals, but also for the people involved in these homes. Um, this can, like I said earlier, ultimately lead to human euthanasia in the extreme cases. Uh, medical conditions that are commonly seen in hoarding cases are malnutrition and starvation, PICA, dehydration, upper respiratory infection or URI, um, parasites, hair loss, severe matting, dental disease, stomatitis, ocular conditions, sores and abscesses, infections, inbreeding, feral behaviors, and the list goes on for a while. Some uh, also in hoarding environments, um, we're not, uh, there are also zoonotic diseases that can be there. Zoonotic means that it, 
we as uh, humans can also get it. It can go back and forth between animals and people. Um, I've actually gotten one of these, Campylobacter, and it's not fun. I got it from a puppy, from a puppy mill environment, and that um, I, I lost 15 pounds in like two weeks. So it's not a joke. You want to be really careful, and these kind of diseases spread very quickly. You guys might be aware of a few of these. The most common one that I know a lot of people know about is uh, ringworm, and of course that is very uh, contagious as well. I think that's what the little kitten has in the photo here, ringworm. Yeah. So understanding the animal hoarder. Understanding the how, when, and why excuses are used uh, helps us anticipate what we're likely to hear when we're involved in animal hoarding cases and also to figure out what kind of intervention um, will be needed. The manner of the intervention, the plan of treatment, and the care management will depend on the individual assessment of each case. <clears throat> So a little bit about um, this subject here. Um, animal hoarding can be associated with a mental health condition. Um, and it can be, um, trauma can actually be the catalyst to its onset. Um, oftentimes with animal hoarding, um, we see that um, the neglect in the home with the animals is also echoed um, with the people involved. And, um, it shows in self-neglect. So um, that's not, it's not uncommon for us to find children or elderly uh, disabled uh, persons in the home that are at risk. And because we are mandated reporters, we are uh, required to uh, contact um, Adult Protective Services or Child Protective Services to come and assist us with these cases when we do see things like that. Um, sadly, uh, these human victims, they receive help only after uh, humane officers um, intervene. There are three classifications of animal hoarders, the overwhelmed caregiver, the rescuer hoarder, and the exploiter hoarder. Um, these classifications are not definitive and some may exhibit characteristics of all three. This is a table that we use to kind of help us strategize and figure out how we will approach a certain um, animal hoarder. So the overwhelmed caregiver, um, they typically, um, they'll be open to assistance from humane officers. Um, initially, they will provide adequate care for their animals. Um, they, have a, they have a strong attachment to their animals. They understand that, they, that there is a problem and that it has gradually developed, even though they, they will minimize it. Uh, they have fewer issues with authority and they're more accepting of intervention. Uh, for plan of treatment and management, um, humane officers will usually offer resources to, to this type of animal hoarder, um, such as spay neuter services, vaccinations, um, donations for cleaning supplies or pet supplies and um, food for their animals. The goal with these uh, types of animal hoarders is to get them to a safe and legal um, number of pets and just to improve the quality of life altogether for, for everyone involved. Um, a rescuer hoarder, um, a rescuer hoarder feels like they have a mission. They, this, this is their life goal um, for saving animals. They have this need to save all the animals. Uh, they develop a compulsion based on a strong need to rescue animals from possible death or even euthanasia. They actively acquire animals and avoid the authorities. They're very good at that. Uh, they feel that no one can take care of the animals the way they can and that they're the ones who have to do this. Um, usually very active in the community and may even adopt more animals through rescue shelters and um, other people uh, because they feel that they can take care of those animals the best. Um, as a fun little number for this picture on the side, I believe there's 14 dogs, one cat, and two birds in this apartment. But in this picture, I um, have counted it multiple times, and I think there's about eight dogs in this picture, um, which if you guys want to look at it for a second and try to get eight, um, it, it can be difficult to find all of them. <laughs> I hope everybody was able to count eight. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. The exploiter hoarder. This is the most difficult um, classification of animal hoarder to work with. Um, they can and will evade and reject authority. And in January of 2017, when I was still a new officer, uh, I, I did work a case where uh, it involved this classification of animal hoarder and the rescue of 180 Yorkies. I don't know if uh, many of you are uh, familiar with that case, but um, humane officers spoke with the animal hoarder and um, they were told that they had 40 Yorkies in the home and that they wanted to surrender the, their pets. But um, when officers arrived to the home, they quickly learned that it was a lot more than 40 Yorkies. Um, it was actually 94 that we ended up bringing in that day. Um, the conditions in the home, they were not good. There was feces, um, mice inside the home, and the dogs were dirty, they were matted, they had fleas, um, they were not in the best of shape. So they were under socialized and they were very difficult to capture. It took humane officers actually about eight hours that day to be able to capture all the, all the animals inside the home. Um, <clears throat> So humane officers thought that they had brought in all the, the dogs in the home, but it turns out uh, that later we received some information that, that one of the uh, persons, the spouse was actually hiding more, more Yorkies. So um, we immediately returned to the property and took custody of an additional 32 Yorkies um, and learned that there was an RV that was purchased for the purpose of fleeing and that they had taken a few more with them. So um, at that point, this case became a criminal case and uh, arrest warrants went out. So as you can see, the exploiter hoarder, it, they will evade law and they will try to be the system and get away with it. I will talk a little bit more about this case as we go down the PowerPoint, but um, for now, when a Go to the next one. So large scale animal rescue is kind of like Betsy's, or Betsy's case over here uh, with the Yorkies. Um, they, the special response team is a team that was involved with this with the transportation of 46, assisted with the transportation with uh, 46 Yorkies from Nevada to San Diego, where ultimately these, uh, the two people went. Um, the medical teams also assisted with, assisted with the exams and officers took, took pictures of all the animals involved. Um, each animal, like this picture portrays over here, is given a unique animal ID and is also given a tag. That's very important, especially in a large scale uh, case like this. You want to be able to differentiate between all the animals, especially because they look very similar. And that way we can also track all their medical uh, treatments and all the care that they would need moving forward. Um, each animal is also photographed. Um, they have a tag next to it, like this photo is. And this is also important when we're uh, compiling criminal cases um, to submit because we need to be able to differentiate in those as well. Um, it's very important to have the case number involved, um, the date that the picture is taken. And also um, in other cases, we want to put the photographer as well. Um, these are extremely important to keep track of. This is another picture where we had another, um, I believe, 20 or so cats being brought in. Um, it's a very large scale effort. It's not just the humane officers involved. We have animal care. We have the supervisors involved. We have medical. We have admissions. We have every department pretty much involved when we are bringing in so many animals. Um, before we bring in those animals, we need to have it approved by the supervisors too, just to make sure that we actually have a place to move these animals. If our shelter is very full, we have nowhere to put them. We need to figure out what we can do because we can't just leave them there. So that's why it is a, a lot of coordination. It takes a lot of time uh, to be able to um, make sure that, um, that these animals have a place to go. When we have large scale um, cases and on the next slide, um, medical also usually meets us on scene, um, which is at the case, um, sometimes let's just say we have a very large scale case, uh, we would have one to three veterinarians on scene, uh, depending on the number of animals, usually one RVT or a registered veterinary technician and two veterinary assistants to help with triaging those animals. Triaging animals um, is broken down into three different tiers. The first, an, uh, first tier is that animals are in pretty good shape. They're just at a quick basic exam. And then they're um, given their unique animal ID and then they're um, 
you know, put into a kennel or a cattery or whichever they, what kind of animal it is. The next tier is that animals um, need medication, some kind of pain meds for something they uh, need on scene. And that's an immediate thing, but it's not an emergent uh, emergency at this point. Um, and the third tier is that the animals need to be hospitalized. They need to be monitored. This is their need to be on IV fluids and somebody needs to be checking them all the time. So it is broken down. Um, sometimes um, there is a fourth tier, but that is the lowest priority, uh, which is if, if in the worst case scenario, there are diseased animals on scene, um, those would be processed last because they don't need the care right now. Um, so it, just like we have the humane officers involved working the cases, we have coordination with the medical team so we can assess and triage animals on scene so they get the proper care. Some of the tools that we used in, use in hoarding cases, and this is not to say we use these only in hoarding cases, these are tools we use almost on a daily basis, but a lot of times with the hoarding cases, these are all used. Um, our favorite one is the towel. The towel is your best friend. We will use it in almost everything. We use it for picking up wildlife. We use it for dog, little dogs, everything. It's the, it's the most versatile tool, tool out there. Uh, we need gloves. These animals are under socialized. Uh, we don't want to get bit. We use them um, for our safety. Um, humane cat traps. I used them in the first video I showed. I had to leave, I think, four or five cat, cat traps that I checked over two days and ended up catching up um, 10 to 15 more cats. Um, and these are always handy uh, when we're leaving them in a home. A snappy snare, it's kind of like a catch pole, but a smaller flexible version and used for smaller dogs. And if there's under socialized dogs that, um, and you know, it might've been needed for the Yorkie case for under socialized dogs, you're using a snappy snare so you can create a distance and be able to um, contain them faster. Catch poles are, a, it's a long leash. It's about six feet long, um, but it's hard and it's for our safety and the animal safety. Um, this is for larger dogs, um, and we would use this in the field or possibly even hoarding cases, um, depending on the situation, of course. And a Freeman net, this is fun. Um, you saw this in the video as well. We, I've used it for popcorn cats. I've used it for raccoons. I've used it for a lot of different things. Um, but the net closes at the top with a sliding part on the handle, and then the bottom of the net opens with a zipper. So it makes it a lot easier um, to be able to transfer animals and also catch animals. Um, and we use this, this is our best friend as well. We will use this on a daily uh, when we're doing hoarding cases. So behind the scenes or on scene, when, when officers go on scene to an animal hoarding case, um, we like to do an initial walkthrough to assess the situation and see what we're um, gonna be dealing with. And we go in, we go into team and the team usually includes a lead, the, the lead investigator on the case. So whoever's case it might be, the lead veterinarian that's going to be doing a lot of the examinations on the animals, um, an officer for evidence collection, uh, a for, an officer for photography to photograph any evidence, and an, a safety officer or a cover officer as well, because we don't know what the conditions are if they're safe um, in that area or in the home. So they'll do a, a walkthrough to assess the scene and see how many, you know, an estimate of how many animals are in the home the conditions and the hazards inside. Um, and we'll communicate all that back to every department um, involved. And uh, like Officer Barrera was saying, we do use a color-coded system to triage the animals. Um, and when we transport the animals back to, to the campus or to where they will be going, um, they are met by triage, uh, I'm sorry, by strike teams. They're called strike teams. And what they, what they consist of is usually a veterinarian and um, this, a scribe and a humane officer. So the veterinarian will do the exams. Uh, the scribe will document any, um, any notes from the veterinarian and the humane officer will photograph uh, the animals. This usually takes place when we seize animals as evidence. So we, we have to document everything and um, we've got to make sure that everything is very thorough and organized. So this type of situation is very common when we are, you know, doing a, a seizure of animals. And here we have an example of departments working together to properly ID, house, and place all healthy animals into housing. So this is a, another really good example of a large scale animal rescue. It's the 84 cockatiel case. 
And the 84 cockatiels were actually found in a one bedroom apartment. They were all free flying and officers found themselves walking in piles of about two feet deep of seeds, seed holes and bird droppings and feathers. Um, the owner actually agreed to surrendering the birds a little bit at a time. Here's another photo. Uh, this is a, the animal owner's uh, bed and it's also the feeding station for the birds. And this little one here um, was named Bookshelf because we found it inside a bookshelf. And um, the, the baby bird was adopted and uh, the reason why we, we found it, because we almost left the, the poor baby, <laughs> was because he started squeaking. And it let us know that he was hiding in the bookshelf. So a lot of times when it comes to cases like this, we have to, we have to go over the scene over and over again and make sure we are not leaving any animals behind. A lot of times with cats, we'll leave traps and we'll come back and check the traps with food um, to make sure we're not leaving any animals behind. We have to be very thorough. Here's a video for the cockatiel case that I will be playing in just a minute. Well, the birds um, aren't in any cages in the apartment. They're flying, free flying in the apartment complex. So um, we have officers and other personnel assisting in putting together bird boxes and um, assisting with pocket packaging them for transportation uh, down the Humane Society. These are birds that are basically unhandled and they're going to be flying all over. We don't want them to get injured. So while we can't totally control the situation and that the birds will be stressed, we're going to try to do it as quickly and gently as possible. Check his pectoral muscles, he is a little thin. They all have been so far. Um, and then I can kind of just lift his body over, grab a wing and kind of extend it, check out the feather quality, which is all kind of dry and a little unkempt. Um, and that's been consistent across all our birds so far. We went back after we got all the, the adults out and I'm like, I'm hearing a chirping. I know I'm hearing it. So we're going, three of us looking around with flashlights and stuff like that. And, and Beverly's like, wait, wait. And then she looked down and there it was in between, in the bookcase and everything, you know. So just combination, we all kept hearing it get closer and closer and <laughs> Beverly found it. So it was pretty awesome. that they're in a more suitable environment um, and, they're, and they're out of those conditions. Um, both the gentlemen that live there and the birds are now um, able to get some help that they need. Just hope that they are all healthy and if uh, they do have any other ailments that can be addressed that they get into um, a healthy place in life and they can be adopted out to good homes. Well, we really like videos because it really shows what's going on. 
uh, but we have another video of what that is behind the scenes with the medical department when we brought in uh, 30 abandoned cats from a condo. Uh, this highlights it very well. So here's another video. And these cats were actually abandoned, but it shows um, the work of the medical team involved. showed a very all-encompassing um, side of medical. Um, here's some more pictures, but what we were seeing was um, they were doing a full exam um, and triaging the animals and they color-coded them uh, based on how emergent uh, the, each cat was. Um, you saw some people running um, cytologies that needed to be processed then, blood work, we had uh, IV fluids going, they were checking um, the mouth, they were checking everything, um, and the cat um, that was in the kennel had just, I believe, just received IV fluids as well. Um, so, and keeping them warm because we don't know how long they've been without food, water, um, and just trying to assess them properly so they can get that care. Um, I wasn't there during this case. I believe Officer Romero was, or Corporal Romero was, um, so she could probably speak more to this one. Yeah, so um, the cats, it was 30 of them that were abandoned in an apartment. And um, they were all sent out to rescue um, afterwards. But um, yeah, it was a it was a total of thirty of them, so we we had quite a quite a bit of people involved in working on this case, um, and I just thought that that was a good video to show. It was you know just medical. You can see them all kind of how they're all working together, um, and it's one one animal at a time. So um, it was very interesting to see that and, and show that to you guys. I thought that would be good. So. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So where you can help. Um, the Yorkie case made national news and due to the strong media presence during the rescue and the rehabilitation, the San Diego Humane Society gained uh, a very large amount of interested um, parties for adoption. So you can help with adopting these animals. Um, in, they, uh, because of the large amount of interested parties, they created a lottery system to adopt out these, these dogs and they were all adopted. Um, 
We received also a lot of volunteer services such as grooming, professional grooming services for the Yorkies that were matted. So those are other ways that you can help volunteering your services uh, that you offer or just your time. Um, <clears throat> and supplies, uh, donating supplies, um, food, litter, bedding, that's always uh, something that we are welcoming. Um, we are so grateful for all the help that we get and we appreciate and depend on you to be able to do what we do. So going back to the Yorkie case, uh, our department communicated closely with um, out-of-state police because the spouse did indeed flee with the remaining Yorkies in an RV they actually went out to Nevada. Um, arrest warrants were sent out and um, the spouse was located along with the additional 44 dogs uh, that, that were living in the RV. Um, due, to, due to the extreme neglect um, and number of animals in this case, and along with the non-compliance from, from the owners, humane officers were obligated to file charges with the DA's office for felony degree uh, animal neglect. So some say that prosecution is not the answer because hoarders are often emotionally troubled and not criminally inclined. But in cases like this, in extreme cases like this, like with the Yorkie case, judges can actually impose conditions that actually help the animal hoarder, such as requiring counseling or prohibiting the person from having a uh, more animals or limiting them to how many they can, they can own. So in this situation, it was necessary. Here are some photos from the Yorkie case of the dogs that were found inside the home. And then here are some dogs in the RV when they were found in Nevada. And the owner was extradited um, inside the RV. Some more photos. So you can see the conditions were not good. And the RV before and after. So the motorhome was ordered restitution by the court. And um, now our emergency response team, they use this RV to deploy and respond to emergency, emergencies and natural disasters. So um, as you've probably figured out by now, hoarding cases is not just us. We work with a lot of different agencies when uh, we uh, go and investigate a hoarding case. Um, some agencies that could be involved um, due to the neglect or other issues that we see in the home are adult protective services um, and child protective services. Um, health department may be involved depending on the level of sanitation. Uh, this is to help with the disease prevention and um, they're one of the biggest ones I call. Environmental health, um, they have jurisdiction over environmentally sensitive areas like waterways. Um, they get involved a lot of the time as well. Uh, code enforcement is my go-to for many cases. Um, they are involved with, uh, with the building structures and they have building enforcement for that, illegal structures, uh, sanitary conditions, and then neglect of property that um, impinges upon neighbors. So neighbors may complain about it as well. Um, and other places that we could call are the fire department, vector control, which is, um, you know, if there's rats and other things in the home, uh, mental health agencies. And there's always really good resources out there that can help those people. And of course, you can call us. Um, if you believe that there are animals involved in the home, please do call us and make a report and we will investigate. We do our best. We investigate pretty much every report that is brought in. So at least there is a paper trail and we can follow through with that. So how officers approach an, a hoarding case? We ask questions, um, questions like, are you having difficulties with your items or possessions or your pets? Um, how long have you lived here? Uh, we want to build a very good rapport with people. Uh, we're not going in, as we call it, badge heavy. We're going in uh, wanting to help and um, with a friendly demeanor. Um, other resources that we can offer to people are donated supplies, low cost spay and neuter services and low cost veterinary care. Um, this is very important because they may not have the means to provide that. Um, we approach every case with compassion. Um, I never want to go in with bias. We don't know the situation of the person and we are there to help and, and also investigate the case. If we need to get to a point like the Yorkie case, 
it can get there, but the first step is to try to help, uh, try to do everything we can. We network with other departments, other agencies, uh, so that we can help this person. If this person does not have plumbing, if this person does not have electricity, we try to figure out what's going on. And we try to network with other agencies like code enforcement so we can um, help this person out and possibly even help restore those services to them. We never give up. Um, the longest hoarding case I've had actually just closed and that was um, almost three years at this point. Um, they do not give up there. Um, many people don't realize that um, hoarding cases can last many years. We had another officer here for many years and her hoarding case is still continuing eight years later. Um, so that is one of the biggest things that people could help with is um, also understanding um, that hoarding cases are long term because we want to help people. Uh, so it's not just go in, take everything. It's more a slow progression. And the problem with going in and taking all the animals right away is that they can just go out and get more. So it's always good to leave a few animals for them, you know, so that they don't have um, the need and, you know, go out there and, and, and try to uh, collect more. Um, let me go to the next slide. So the benefits of having this integrated coordinated approach, there's so many. Um, we are so lucky because we have CREST, uh, which, which stands for Cognitive Rehabilitation Exposure Sorting Therapy. And we meet with them and other professionals in different agencies um, quarterly um, to discuss different approaches and discuss real cases. So uh, we are lucky to have that here in San Diego County. Um, but CREST provides both mobile and in-clinic sessions. And um, the treatment is provided by a team of psychologists, social workers, and mental health professionals. Uh, the treatment includes evaluation, care management, peer support, um, support groups for family members, and more. Um, you have to be 60 years or older, enrolled or eligible for Medi-Cal, and reside in San Diego County to qualify and get these free um, services. But right now, due to the pandemic, they are not taking any new cases. So that's really unfortunate. But um, we're very lucky to have um, them as a resources. I'm sorry, as a resource. So again, animal hoarding and hoarding is, is a community concern. It can result in fire hazards, insects and rodents in the neighborhood, neglect of animals, uh, neglect of people, building code violations, structural damage, um, sanitation and odor nuisances. So they cannot go ignored, but that's why together we can make a difference. And to clarify, we didn't do the cleanup here. This is coordinating with other um, agencies who went and helped clean the home for the person. Yeah. So hoarding versus legitimate sheltering or rescue organization. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about this just to um, show you a few things that you can look into to be able to determine whether you're dealing with animal hoarding or with um, a rescue or, or you know, legitimate shelter organization. So because a lot of times animal hoarders, they will mask as a rescue um, when in reality, they're, they may just be an overwhelmed um, animal hoarder or a rescuer animal, ho animal, animal hoarder, sorry. So uh, one of the things that you can look into is are they willing to let visitors see the facilities or the animals? Um, do they have staff or volunteers, enough of them to keep up with the needs of the animals at their location? Do they have 501c3 paperwork? things like that. And that will help you kind of determine if you're dealing with someone that's just, you know, hoarding animals or if they truly are a rescue. Here's a good book. Um, one of the few books actually on animal hoarding. And it's the case of um, Barbara Erickson and her 552 dogs. Um, this provides a look at how animal hoarding developed in a woman's life. And um, the story is told through investigative journalism. So it's actually pretty good. 
Now we're going to talk about one quick case study. Um, this was a case that was reported by the neighbors of this person. Um, it took a, quite a long time to get to the bottom of what was going on. Um, so I'll show you some pictures and kind of walk you through what happened. So this is the home that was reported. Um, outside appearance is very deceiving. It doesn't look horrible at all. It just kind of overgrown, looks like a normal home. There's a dog there. Everything looks fine and dandy. Um, you would never suspect a thing um, except for the horrible smell. Pretty much the scenario is, is that there's a single man in his 60s living in this home. He would trap uh, feral and neighborhood cats and put them in his cattery in the backyard. He would separate the cats by sex, and then he had a full system going on for how he worked with these cats. Um, there was no family involvement that we knew of. Uh, neighbors had been complaining about the horrible smell for many years. Um, officers just could not get past the lock gate. It was just impossible. Uh, neighbors allowed neighbors actually allowed the officers into the um, to their yard so they could look into this man's yard. Um, we can do that if um, there's compliance with the neighbors, just so we can get a better idea of what we're getting ourselves into and have more information. Uh, the man consented to an inspection of the cattery one day, uh, but only of the backyard and not of the inside of his home. And the next pictures will show um, that the cattery was clean, water and food was available. Um, the question I ask is what classification of hoarder is this person most likely to be? Um, this would be more of like a rescuer, exploiter hoarder, uh, depending on that, based on, I mean, sorry, based on the information given here. These are the pictures that officers took um, from the neighbor's yard. Um, you can see that there's tarp covering many structures in the, build, uh, in the back over here. You see one little kitten standing on top of a tarp. Um, and most of the stuff that the officers could see was just covered in tarp. And there's more tarp pictures <laughs> in the next couple of slides. Uh, yeah, this is the side yard. There's more tarp. There's just miscellaneous debris there. A lot of just junk that you would um, see just littered around the yard. And most of it is, of course, covered in tarp. And more tarp pictures. There's a kitten right there going into a little tire over there. So we know that there's cats on scene, uh, but we don't know what's going on underneath all of that. So when he let um, officers in, they saw a very clean cattery. There's fresh food, there's fresh water. Um, it's a little strange that there's um, cardboard um, for the cats, but there's nothing horrible here and not much that we as officers can do, especially with the animals being an overall good health and the environment being um, sanitary. And there's more pictures of the cats here and the his cattery. Um, and they're friend, they're overall okay looking. Um, and as more as time went on, um, we uh, found out more information. Uh, information on the next slide. Um, neighbors stated that the man did not live well in the house. Um, live uh, live in the house, sorry, but he lived in a shed in his backyard. Um, officers questioned the man, but the man denied that he lived in the shed. He did not want to give any other information. Um, so, what agency would be contacted potential uh, regarding the potential hazardous smell? Um, that would be environmental health. Um, and of course, there's an overlap of all the agencies that we work with, but environmental health would be the one we would contact. Contact Neighbors also said that there were a lot of rats on the property. They saw them everywhere, and then officers requested photos of the rats and the droppings. Um, so they sent them over, um, and there were rats that were deceased. There were rats all over the property, droppings in every area that you could find. Um, so the agency that would be contacted regarding a rodent problem would be vector control. Um, so with those pictures that the neighbors provided, um, those were able to be submitted to Vector and Vector could get involved at this point. Um, when we got involved um, and they were able to get into this home due to those pictures that were provided from neighbors, just like you guys would be, um, we got inside the house and this is what was found inside of the house. The home looked to be almost completely gutted. It almost looked like a fire went through the house. The outside looked perfectly fine, but the inside looked like this. Um, and that's probably why the um, man lived in a uh, shed in the backyard. Yep. I don't know what that happened. And then um, a lot of cobwebs in this home, um, possible fire. We don't know when this fire happened um, and a lot of just uh, debris. Um, once other agencies went in, the home was condemned and did have to be floored. Um, I guess there's more pictures. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a good amount of pictures. I might have 
forgotten to delete all of them. But these are just all the different um, aspects of the home. Um, it's mostly all burnt down, all destroyed. It's gutted out. And now the property looks like this. It was condemned and the whole property had to be uh, floored um, and is no longer there. Um, as far as the man, he kind of disappeared overnight. We don't know where he went. We have no information about him except the house, uh, which we were able to get into. And, you know, that's not necessarily a hoarding case. He does have a lot of cats and stuff in the cattery that were overall okay. But once we start investigating, you can see that a lot of other information comes out. Um, and then with other agencies involved, uh, we can get to the bottom of it and be able to try to help this person. Rats, we almost forgot. So we actually uh, happened upon um, a case involving rats, domestic rats. Um, we received a report of a van uh, parked outside the, in the parking lot outside the, the animal owner's uh, place of uh, employment. And the vehicle was non-functional. That's she, the, the owner actually called us for assistance because um, the rats were in her vehicle. Her vehicle was non-functional and um, they were chewing on the wires. <laughs> they were chewing on the wires of the vehicle. So um, the, the windows were cracked a little bit in, the in her vehicle and the rats were actually getting out and roaming about in the parking lot. And, you know, people were seeing this and they were also calling us. Uh, we went out and we saw that there were rat cages with little fans inside the, inside the vehicle. And um, when we talked to the rat owner, uh, she mentioned to us that she um, had 20 rats with water and battery operated fans inside, but upon a closer look, we, we noticed that it was actually a lot more rats than that, um, and, and it, there was a very strong odor of urine. Um, the rat owner also told us that she had started out with just a pair, a male and a female, and that they had multiplied very quickly. Um, so after everything was said and done, we actually ended up picking up about 200 adult rats and 100 um, babies. They were surrendered to humane officers out in the field. And I have some more photos. These are some photos of inside the van that was out in the parking lot. So rats can multiply very quickly. They have a 21 day gestation period. So if you just start with two rats and then you put 21 days for, for eating, uh, you'll have a lot of rats very, very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So this might have happened in a matter of a couple of months at most. And as you can see, they were chewing on different parts of the vehicle there. But we're happy that we were able to help because that's just too many pets. We also have a nice video to show um, a little bit more about what happened with this rat um, hoarding case.
Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, if you have any questions, we are happy to answer them. I think you can put them in the chat box and um, I think we could figure them out. Should I stop sharing my screen at this point? Uh, you can stop sharing it and then we'll give everyone a few minutes for questions. And then if nobody has any, we will go ahead and head out. I feel like it was very informative. So there probably aren't a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> So Lisa says, do you help other states with their hoarders? I take that one, Betsy. I'm sorry? You wanna take that one? Sure, um, actually we, I don't know if we have with animal hoarding. We definitely do help other states. Um, our, we, we do deploy off to different um, states to assist with different types of cases. I don't know if we've had uh, the opportunity to assist with an animal hoarding case, but that is something that I'm sure we are open to doing. I know we've um, assisted um, with uh, roosters and dogs, um, a lot of dogs in a home, but they weren't necessarily related to hoarding. Um, they were related to other cases in other states. So we went to help them. We have a couple more. Um, sorry, scrolling down. Marnie said, the man who hoarded cats, were there cats in the home that was torn down? I don't believe there were cats um, from what I read of the case. This is not my case personally. Um, it was just an inter interesting case to discuss. Um, from the case um, notes I read, uh, the cats were primarily outdoors and inside the cattery. The home was just littered with stuff and almost gutted out and nothing was nothing living as far as we know was outside, or, sorry, inside the home. Yes, I don't believe there were any cats inside the home. They were all outside. Um, Carol asked, if an animal is brought in by humane law enforcement, is it always a hoarding case? Can you clarify that question? Because um, we bring in a lot of animals daily. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're able to reword the question a little bit, I can answer it. Um, and in the meantime, Alexandra asked, is, are there any special trainings that humane officers need in order to respond to hoarding cases? We go through a lot of uh, training. We have extensive training and we do actually, we, we have to go through an academy. Uh, and we also, uh, in our academy, we do a certain amount of hours um, taught by a veterinarian. Uh, for the medical aspect of, of care for animals, and as well as the law enforcement side. So yes, there's, there's an extensive training that is required for humane officers um, before investigating cases like this. Um, and Carol reworded it and said, what are the other cases besides hoarding? So why, why else would we maybe bring in an animal through HLE? Got it. Uh, we, um, so we have the animal control contract as well, and we also do investigations. Um, so we respond to all different types of animal cases. If there's animals running loose in wherever you are, we respond to that and see if we can locate that animal and contain that animal. That would be a reason we bring in an animal. Um, we respond to injured wildlife, injured animals. So we bring in injured animals to our um, Project Wildlife over here, injured animals to a uh, medical department, and then they're processed through our system. We also do investigations if we need to um, do surrenders in the field. Uh, people are unable to keep their animals. We will sign them over in the field and they become the Humane Society's property. Um, that's another reason we would bring them in. Um, I'm also trying to think we might, in, in extreme cases and investigations, we may also seize animals. Um, and that would be more in criminal cases that we would be taking, bringing in animals. Uh, those are a few, if um, that's you have a few more. Uh, let me see. I'm not seeing any other questions. A few more um, reasons we would bring animals in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she, you did mention the seizures yeah. of animals. Okay. Yeah, I think think you covered it. Yeah. No, I think you covered it. And then we do yeah. have training. Of course, we do. Our job is working with animals, so we have extensive training um, with animal handling um, and working with animals in all different capacities. 
Um, we go through our academy, like Officer Romero, Corporal Romero, I keep forgetting, um, stated. Um, and also we go through our field training um, with another experienced officer so we can get hands-on training in the field as well. We do have an actual um, training on animal hoarding in particular for our academy. So um, that is something that we also um, have to undergo before we uh, investigate these types of cases. But a lot of it is also on the job training. All right. It looks like that was the last of our questions, unless we get any in there last minute. But thank you, um, Corporal Romero and Officer Barrar. That was so informative and so great. And thank you to everyone who attended today. I hope you learned a lot and that you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. If you have questions, I think you could just email. I'm not sure what the email is, but uh, we're happy to answer them in the future. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.